All right, we have a couple of more people ju that are just signing in, and then we're going to get started. <laughs> Let them get seated. I'm a back girl, back row girl myself, so I don't ask folks to move up. <laughs> I figure you can sit where you want to sit. <laughs> <laughs> no, because we have two more. I think just in time. Just in time after we do our other ones. Well, I think people are still coming in, so we're going to go ahead and get started. <laughs> I want to thank you for coming. Uh, my name is um, Dr. Susan Maycock, and I will uh, tell you a little bit more about myself after um, we really get started. But before that, we just want to have a word of prayer because this is all about healing and keeping you healthy, and we count on our Father to do that for us. So let's bow our heads together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to share the knowledge of the simple remedies that you have that can keep our health in um, optimum working order. And we just ask that now as we come together to learn some of these principles, that um, you be with us, help us to um, learn enough to keep us healthy, especially in these times. And again, just thank you for the wisdom and thank you for every person that's here. And please bless those who are yet on their way and let them arrive safely. These are all things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, again, I say welcome. Um, it's exciting to see you. I hope we're, that you're as excited about this topic as we are. Some of you may not even really know what hydrotherapy is about, and that's it, kind of exciting. Um, but before we get too far into that, and before I introduce myself and um, my co-speaker, we kind of want to know who you are. So, Julia, I'm ask, actually going to ask you if you'll take your mic around. Um, we kind of want to know who you are, um, so you can just give us your name and what you're hoping to get out of this seminar, and that will help us to know whether or not we're going to deliver it. <laughs> okay? Which slide should we start on? Either one. Which, right. Who wants to start? We'll start over here. Hi, I'm uh, Dan Wolf, and I'm looking at uh, things that can help improve my health so I can continue to be mobile. Awesome. Thank you. Mary Lou Anderson. Jim Zimba. My wife, Lorraine Zimba. And, and what are you hoping? Yeah, better life stuff than water. Oh, water, water therapy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hello, I'm Pat Hardy, and I'm hoping to learn simple remedies instead of taking medication. Hi, I'm Brian Watson. Anything that might help alleviate some of this back pain. Della Lapine, and probably the same thing, pain relief. Hello, everyone. My name is Brittany. Um, just interested in the benefits that water can have for our bodies and sharing them with my family so we can be healthy as much as possible. Hi, my name is Medessa Melton, and this is my granddaughter, Skylyn Guile. And um, I, same thing, I, I want to be healthier and uh, learn all I can to take care of my body and to share it with others. 
My name's Erin, and I want to learn a good way to relax after work. My name is Linda, and uh, I'm interested in things like pain relief and uh, also uh, decongesting, that kind of thing. Okay. Hi, my name is Roslyn, and I'm interested in um, natural healing. Okay. Thank you. Well, thankfully, I didn't hear anything that is contrary to what hydrotherapy can do for you. So let's dive into it. Well, before I do, I should, again, um, you guys said who you are. Again, I'm um, Susan Maycock, and I am a um, educational specialist for the University of Michigan Health System. I'm also a clinical adjunct faculty with the School of Nursing. Interestingly enough, None of this topic was ever taught to me in any of my studies um, at, for nursing. This is something that had to come from outside um, that. And again, because we rely so heavily on um, medicinal type um, things, chemical type uh, remedies, but some of those natural remedies like this are still very much a part of things. And my co-presenter is Julia Roach. I, um, Susan is my mother, and I kind of stumbled on hydrotherapy a little by accident, a little intentionally. I think someone, or maybe a couple people said that you're looking for ways to either reduce or eliminate taking conventional medicine where it makes sense to. And that's kind of where I started in my journey. So I've done a lot of research, um, trial and error, and try to educate myself and you know kind of my my husband and kids were my guinea pigs at first but I've also done this with people that are not related to me uh, so I'm hoping to share some of that knowledge that I've learned with you all and hopefully you'll be able to experience some of the benefits um, in ways that I have okay thank you yeah so Julia's going to just pass out something if you wanted to take notes I, I copied our presentation, and then after I copied it, I realized that it, the print is kind of tiny. So, um, but at least you have something to write on if um, you need it. So while she's passing it out, I will say um, again that hydrotherapy is the use of water, and what we're going to be talking about is the use of water externally for uh, the treatment of disease, illness, ailments, and the use of water in any of its three forms. So that can be liquid, that can be ice, that can be steam, and again, to treat trauma or disease. It, it goes all the way back to ancient Greece and in Rome, and they I mean, actually I mean, had the um, natural remedies using hot springs. In fact, there are still some hot springs that folks will flock to because it helps Did with pain relief. Um, they had actually had public bathhouses. I, I was going to leave this door open so um, you could hear better. Would that help? Okay. Forgot. I have to tell Julia she's got her mic on. <laughs> you had your mic on. <laughs> um, Anyway, so other terms that you might hear are water therapy, aqua therapy, and then again, we're calling it hydrotherapy. So what, what does water do for you? It actually does everything for you. Your, the majority of your body is made up of water. So your brain, 75%, um, your blood, 83% water, your whole lymphatic system, it's, which is what gives you your immunity, 94%. Um, your lungs, 80%. You see that water is an integral part of your body. It regula regulates your body temperature. Your brain needs it in order to function. It lubricates your joints. Water is the major component of most of your body parts. It is huge. So that is what our bodies are made up of. In order to keep that part of us healthy, we have to drink water. So with, with that being said, with me saying, what does water do for you? And I just told you all of those things. What do you think the lack of water does for you? And this is going to be conversational. So just anybody, what do you think not having enough water inside of your body, namely drinking it? And notice we gave you some when you came in. And don't be shy about sipping it. What do you think that would lead to? Dehydration. dehydration. Absolutely. And if you're dehydrated, what are some of the, what are some of the ways you might feel? What is it? A headache? A headache? Um, 
Migraines, yep. Sluggish. Sluggish, absolutely. Nausea, okay. What was it? Joint pain? You got it. You guys got it. Headaches, back pain, fatigue, foggy thinking, certainly dry skin. You get that in the winter. Um, you need to drink more water. Thick, um, sluggish blood. I heard that. Just a sluggish um, uh, body. I heard that. You don't have any energy. Believe it or not, it can also lead to your blood pressure being up. It can also lead to shortness of breath. It can also lead to accumulated chronic inflammation, not having enough water. So drink that water. And examples of that inflammation would be arthritis and fibromyalgia. And you know fibromyalgia, if you know anyone with it, whether you have it yourself, or if you know someone with it, very difficult to treat. Same thing with, with um, arthritis. So you can at least help your own case by drinking water. I can't say enough about water. So what does water, well, not having water do for you? Nothing. It, you have to have water. Um, and water, what are some of the ways you like to enjoy water besides drinking it? What are some of the ways you enjoy it? Swimming. Swimming. Bath. Bath. Yeah. What else? Drinking it. Okay, Skylar. <laughs> what else? Boating, yeah. And what else? Floating, yeah, absolutely. We, you, you can't even imagine the earth without water because it is a part of everything. It's a means of transportation. You can, uh, you said boating. Um, back in the, in the day and even now in some countries, Water is the way that they get around. So it's a means of transportation. It's a form of recreation, whether it's in the frozen form, as in snow or ice, or whether it's in the liquid form for swimming during the summer. Um, all of it, water is important. So we're going to talk about the three forms of water, because now we're going to start talking about what we do to help our bodies heal with water. So water comes in in three forms, water, which is liquid, then the solid, which is ice, and then steam, which is vapor. And we're going to talk about how to use each one of those um, for your body. So let's talk a, lot, a little bit about liquid water. The earth is about 70 to 75 percent water. It's readily available in most of our homes here in the United States. We're very, very fortunate um, for that. Um, you can swim in it. Um, it's used in as far as for hydrotherapy, it's used in short cold baths, it's, uh, which can be full body or localized. It can be used in contrast showers, and we're going to show you how to do that in our next session. Again, that can be full body, no, we're going to do that tonight, um, or full body or localized, or hot baths. I heard someone say that um, they take a bath. Awesome awesome way to relax. Do you know how many people have gotten away, and it might even be you, away from taking baths? So many folks rely just on showers now, but baths can still be a form of relaxation. You don't think about that as therapy, but yes, if you haven't taken a bath in a while, try it. Hot bath is awesome. And then there's the solid water, or ice as we know it. Um, it needs to be frozen, obviously, and we use that in hydrotherapy in ice massages. Ice decreases inflammation. It decreases swelling. It decreases pain. So anytime you have an in injury, you might have already heard that you need to rest that injured part, ice it, because that's what's going to do it. You contain the swollen part and you elevate it. But that ice is very important for slowing down that inflammatory process and relieving the pain. Um, you can use ice cubes in cold water basin for extreme temperature, and that increases a therapeutic reaction. And we're going to talk about what that reaction is in a little bit. So then we have vapor or steam. And that steam is the most intense heat application that you can do. And it's got a lot of energy in it. And I won't go into the chemistry piece of it, but in this particular course, we're going to talk about it in um, 
as far as the benefits of using steam for steam inhalation, and you're going to see that tonight, and then the Russian steam bath, and that's going to be in the next session. Any steam treatment can, um, because of the intense heat, you just have to be really be careful so that you don't burn yourself or the person that you're trying to treat. So now we're going to have to have a little science review. We're going to talk a little bit about anatomy and physiology. We're going to talk about pathology and a little bit of chemistry. So now be honest, how many of you did I lose when I said we're going to do the, the science piece? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> All right. But it's important. It really is important because in order to understand how hydrotherapy works, it's really important to understand how the, the anatomy and physiology works because that's how the body itself works. And then that pathology. The pathology is what went wrong with the original. That was one of my favorite classes in school when I took pathology because, you know, we had already learned about the normal. But then to learn about what went wrong, that was really exciting to me. And then the chemistry, the details of water in the body and on the body and how um, that works. So let's talk a little bit about chemistry. So we're going to talk about how to manage this heat. Um, the heat is important. In conduction, and we're not going to always say, well, you're going to use conduction right now, but just know that in conduction, two things, are, the heat is touching. Two things have to be touching in order for the heat to transfer. So you see that hot pack, and some of you have used that um, already. That hot pack transfers heat to the body for a therapeutic uh, effect of relaxation. And then the cold pack takes the heat away from the body, and that's what increases the uh, or decreases the pain and decreases the inflammation. And we're going to talk about how to use that conduction with water to do those two, um, to achieve those two things. And then you have uh, radiation or heat transfer from objects not touching. So before it was objects touching, hot pad, cold pad. Now we're talking about heat that's uh, the transfer of objects not touching. So that would be in the ambient. So the dry sauna and the benefits of that. The sun radiation, do you think about that as therapy? Sun radiation actually is therapy when used in the right doses. And then we have um, convection and that moves the air away. Um, uh, the transfers the heat away and that too is an important part. So we're going to talk about evaporation, giving off heat by way of vapor, sweating to maintain balance. This is so important. I did, this was one of my takeaways when I first started learning about hydrotherapy. Um, the body likes to maintain its balance. Too much heat accumulated and the body will perspire. Perspiration is an excellent way to detoxify the body. I did not actually realize that. And because I'm one, my daughter Julia, we were in the same class, in aerobics class. She was sweating profusely from head to toe. I was pretty much just dry as a little cucumber, had just a little bit of, maybe just a little spot on my back. And, you know, I, I don't know. I didn't realize, but they say that the those of us who sweat the least actually carry the most toxins. She's sweating off those toxins, and I was not. And I so they was just building up. I, I had no idea. So um, treatments to induce sweating when you have an illness can be of benefit to you. So a dry sauna, a wet sheet pack, chest fomentations, and we'll talk about chest fomentations, but we're not going to demonstrate those, but we will talk about them because they're very involved and, but very, very useful um, uh, with the hot foot bath. Usually it takes several cycles or minutes for sweating to occur. Like I said, Julia had it down. She, a <laughs> couple of times up and down, our instructor's name was Jonas, and Jonas, <laughs> a couple of times, he would have her sweating like crazy, and I was just there. But now I know I want to sweat, and so if I don't do it naturally, I will induce it. And then um, we change vapor um, into liquid for the purpose of heating. 
and those would be the steam inhalation, which you will see tonight, and the Russian steam bath. And then remember, I talked about ice and the ice massage. And notice I said a massage. And you can just put ice, you know, when someone tells you put ice on an injury, and you can put it on that injury. But, you know, it gets a little uncomfortable after a while. Um, so the friction will actually decrease the amount of time that you have to put that ice on, and it also produces a more robust reaction. So think about that the next time um, you're doing an ice massage to actually massage it into um, that joint. And then the steam bath, and we're, gonna, we're going to demonstrate this for you the next time. The steam bath is a very powerful treatment for quick and deep whole body heating. The body is exposed to trapped uh, steam. So we will... Um, Again, talk about uh, reducing the inflammation by removing heat and increasing circulation by adding heat. So it just depends on which illness or which condition you're trying to treat, uh, which one you're going to do, whether you're going to remove heat or whether you're going to add heat. So since all the body systems are connected and rely upon each other for optimal functions, all systems are affected by hydrotherapy treatments but the following are immediately influenced and will be discussed in more depth, and that's the skin, the nervous system, the circulatory system. So let's talk about the skin. Look at your own, uh, your own hand, your own skin. It's, it doesn't look very complex when you look at it like this, but it is very complex. You see it has multiple layers, and because hydrotherapy is performed on the skin, it's really important to understand some of the skin's functions because it really serves as the means of conveying that message that you're trying to get for the therapeutic effect to the body. So the outer layer is where most of the function exists, and that it's kind of superficial, so that's pretty much what you see right here. Um, the entire body is covered with skin. It's our first layer of protection against any disease um, that is topical, um, not your airborne diseases. Uh, it, uh, and then you, under that, you have your epidermis, and that's mostly the dead cells. That's what you've got to get rid of, are those dead cells that are sloughing off, because that's where your bacteria and your pathogens are. And then the next layer under that is the dermis, and it is where your lymph vessels are, um, your T cells, your, you've heard of those, your killer T cells. That's what you want to stimulate to stimulate your immune system. And again, we're going to tell you how to do it. And then the dermis contains um, lots of capillaries. So the skin is so intimately related to the central nervous system that we just had to talk about it in connection with hydrotherapy. So now we're going to get closer to actually demonstrating, um, and Julia's going to take that part, um, our treatment. But look at the breakdown. We, we say the word disease. This was another thing that struck me, but I'm kind of nerdy like that. It's really dis-ease. So when our bodies are optimum, they're at ease. When they're not, when they're sick, when there's something going on, it's dis-ease. I just said, oh, look at that. That's really great. So in, it's an effort to free the system from conditions that result from a violation of the laws of health. In other words, uh, we're going to talk about how to understand it, how, to, how hydrotherapy works, and how to help the body correct itself and get back to the ease that it wants to have in order to um, function. So what we're going to do, we're going to talk about cold water therapy because cold water therapy increases metabolism, it boosts immunity, it's a pain reducer, and it stabilizes blood pressure. Hot water therapy relaxes muscles, improves circulation, and increases flexibility and mobility, and it's, most, it's the one that's most wisely used in hydrotherapy technique. And you'll get a little taste of that right now. Oops.
All right, I can hear. Is that better? All right. So tonight, we are going to demonstrate for you two treatments. Well, partially demonstrate one of them. Um, this isn't the perfect environment for doing all of the treatments, so we're trying to make do with, with what we have. The first thing that we're, that we're going to do is the steam inhalation treatment. And this is one that I personally use on a near constant basis. It helps for a variety of different things, mostly with allergies when I'm suffering, from, I have seasonal allergies, if I feel like I'm coming down with a cold, if I'm congested, if I have a headache, this is my go-to. And we have, um, so we being my husband, my son and I, first thing we do, I'm starting to feel sniffles, steam inhalation, let's go. It's something that you, um, can do just about anywhere. All you really need access to is steam. Um, and so I have on the table here, I'll be asking for a volunteer in a little bit for, some, for someone who might want to experience this treatment um, after I describe what it involves. Um, but you can, if you have a bowl and access to um, water and a way to heat it up, which reminds me, I want to make sure that this is nice and hot. All right, I have an electric tea kettle there. Um, if you have access to those things and a few other basic things, a cloth to wipe your face afterwards, a towel to put over your head, you've got the basics for it. So it doesn't require a lot of money. It doesn't require a lot of time. Um, it can go, you can go anywhere from three to five minutes up to about 20 minutes, um, depending on what effect you're looking for. It can be used not just for the things that I described, but also to help you relax. So it's really, really helpful. Um, and most people uh, can, can benefit from it. And we'll get into who isn't a good candidate for this type of treatment. So steam inhalation. Let's go first into a definition. What is it? It's essentially directed water vapor from a soy source of boiling or steaming water to the nose or mouth area. The act of breathing the water vapor in to treat nasal or upper respiratory congestion, irritation, or dryness. It can also be used for relaxation as well. Um, the effect that it has on your body is to keep your nasal mucous membranes from drying out excessively, and it helps loosen secretions and stimulate um, discharge of mucus from the lungs, throat, and upper respiratory passages. It can help relieve spasms uh, in breathing in both your throat and sinuses or asthma and allergies and it can help relieve upper respiratory tract from irritating substances air inflammation and congestion so what are the indications or under what conditions would you want to do this treatment coughing it can help with coughing um, i'll get into in a little while uh, talking about some using this treatment along with uh, essential oils. I also use essential oils a lot. And there are some essential oils when paired with this treatment. They're designed to help aid with coughing or reducing coughing. Sometimes um, if you have a cold, we had COVID earlier in the year and I was doing the steam inhalation. I was doing the contrast showers. Um, I didn't have enough energy to do like the chest fomentations, but if I had, I would have done that as well. And the essential oils added to the steam inhalation really had a, like a double effect um, for that treatment. Other ways that you would want, or other indications for this would be congestion in the lungs, nose, throat, and sinuses, throat irritation or dry mouth, it can help with that. Again, irritations from allergies, it can help relieve some of those symptoms, and it can be used to loosen dry or thick secretions in the respiratory tra tract. So getting rid of some of that gunk that can build up when you're sick and have some type of upper respiratory infection. What are the contraindications or precautions? When, when would we not want to use this treatment or when would we want to be cautious um, or make modifications to the treatment? First one would be with extremely young children or very elderly who may not be able to respond to heat well or be able to tell you if the heat is too hot because the steam is vapor and that is really intense latent heat. So we, you wouldn't want to do this with someone um, who couldn't communicate, you know, it's too hot, it's too strong to you, obviously, and that would be very young, very elderly. 
uh, clients with severely compromised cardiovascular systems or um, heart disease, that, that m where they would find it difficult to breathe humid air. Uh, you would want to uh, consider not using this with them. And then a precaution would be you want to obviously be mindful of the intense heat and avoid burning your clients. So I'll demonstrate for you how to kind of check in, ask good open-ended questions, make sure that the person that you're doing this with, if it's family member or otherwise, is comfortable and kind of picking up on those cues that they give you to let you know when things are uncomfortable for them. Because sometimes people are, you know, they're like, well, let me see if I can suffer through this. And you don't want anyone to suffer through anything. You want to make sure that it's as comfortable for, for your husband, your spouse, your children um, as possible. So what equipment do we need? Not very much. Um, it lists out eight things, but don't let that be daunting. Um, the first thing is you always want to make sure that you have everything ready before you begin. You'll need a heat source. So I like to use um, an electric kettle. You might not be able to see it here. It doesn't, um, it, it's very portable. I have a tote with the things that I carry around for the different treatments that, that I like to do. The electric kettle, as long as you have a power supply, that works. If you just have a regular kettle, you can do that as well. And I bought this from Best Buy. This is just an induction burner. I think I picked this up for $30 on sale. So this is just like a, a, a stove burner top that you could take with you in a tote and have a traditional teapot kettle. That's another way to um, have the heat source. You could use a rice cooker. Um, you could have water in a slow cooker kind of sitting to the side and just heating up. There's a variety of different ways. The bottom line is you just need to get some hot water that has some steam coming off from it. So be creative. And then last but not least, you could also use portable steamers. Um, I don't own one of these, but I believe you can purchase them from most pharmacies would have them where it just kind of is a, a plastic device with a, a unit. I think they're battery operated. You turn it on, pour some water in it, and it starts to steam up. So that's another option as well. Then you just need to heat your water up. Um, if you're using essential oils, you would want to put a drop or two of whatever essential oil that you're you're interested in using in the pot, depending on the reason for the treatment. So if I'm trying to break up some congestion or if I have a headache, I definitely use tea tree oil. If I, um, peppermint oil is good for breaking up congestion and um, eucalyptus oil. If you're going for more of a relaxation effect, I would suggest something like lavender, uh, maybe chamomile, something like that um, to help you relax. Um, after you, well, another piece of the equipment, let me not say after, would be a large towel because the steam needs to be um, captured or enclosed around your head. So you'd need a towel to put over your head. You'd need a bowl or some other type of basin or receptacle to hold the water. A shower cap is optional. Sometimes people don't want their hair to get steam. It might ruin the, the hairstyle that they just paid money for. So. I like to have a, a shower cap handy in instances like that. And then an extension cord. If you happen to be using a um, something that needs electricity to power like the steam kettle. The procedure, it is pretty easy. And I will demonstrate this, but first I wanna talk through it with you. I like to hear what, what someone is trying to, to teach me and then see it. So um, that's what we'll do. And then after this slide, I'll move right into to, to demonstrating it. So the first thing, choose your heat source. Next, if you're using essential oil and you don't have to, the steam vapors work well by themselves. I would say that the essential oil is just to kind of give it a boost depending on, on the, your tolerance or your client's tolerance and you know their desire to have it or not. Then you'd start by explaining the treatment to, to the person that you're going to do it on so they know what to expect, their face will become hot, you know, explaining all of those things to them. We'll do that in a moment. If your client or person that you're doing this with has any type of jewelry or glasses on, you'd want to ask them to remove them. Provide a shower cap as an option if, if they want that. 
um, I like to pray with, with the people that I'm doing with and ask that God will, you know, send his blessing for this treatment and may it heal them. Um, then you give instructions for how to actually do it. So you, after you explain the treatment to the person that you're doing it with, you ask them to lean over the bowl. You have the essential oil already in there. You pour the hot water in. Ask, instruct them to breathe deeply um, throughout, asking open-ended questions to make sure that they're comfortable and it's not too hot, um, being very cautious not to burn them, and depending on the duration that you do it, um, I, I'll show how you can, you know, just use a simple timer. That's another, I forgot to include that on the equipment list, but you can use your watch, your cell phone. Um, and then afterwards, you end the treatment with a cold um, washcloth to the face just to cool the face down quickly. And that's it in a nutshell. And then you can repeat this treatment every three to four hours as needed. So when I'm doing this myself, and you don't need someone else to do it for you, you can you could do this on your own actually. And even if you don't have access to um, access to a bowl, sometimes in the and this kind of goes into the contrast shower. Sometimes I can just use the the steam in the shower as a proxy for you know the actual towel over the head experience, and it it can also help. And then at the very end, you'll just want to make sure that you disinfect the bowl. If you're doing, you know, multiple people back to back, you know, if you have several kids in your house and they're coming down with symptoms, you just want to make sure that you disinfect in between uses. So, is anyone brave enough to come up front and volunteer to experience this treatment? All right, come on up. I forgot your name. Okay, I almost said Roxanne. Roslyn, please have a seat. All right, Roslyn, thank you for being a volunteer for this treatment. Um, I would first like to ask you, would you like any essential oils in your water? Okay, do you have a preference? Uh, peppermint and tea tree is what I have here. I have lavender as well. Peppermint? Okay. So I'll just go with one drop. Peppermint can be pretty intense. All right, so now that I've got that in there, I am going to explain um, this treatment to you as I would if I was doing this with anybody. So first thing I would always do before um, beginning a treatment is to go down the list of contraindications. So reasons or instances in which I would not want to do this with someone. Now normally you're probably going to be doing this with you know, very close family and friends, people that you know very well. I'm really just saying this for the point of if you happen to do this for someone that you don't know very well, you don't want to make any false assumptions. And so it's always good to check with them and make sure that, you know, they don't have any of the conditions that this treatment or other treatments wouldn't be suitable for. Uh, so Roslyn, you don't appear to be elderly or extremely young, so I think we're good on that one. Um, do you have any cardiovascular issues or uh, congestive heart failure issues? Okay, and that was really the only one, and I just am going to make sure one of the precautions on here is that I will make sure that I take care not to do anything that's going to burn you. Uh, so, Rosalind, this treatment is really good for if you are experiencing coughing, if you have allergy symptoms or asthma, if your throat is irritated or scratchy, if you have mucus in your chest and in your throat, it's really good for breaking those breaking those types of things up. So I'm going to um, get some hot water. I will pour it in the bowl, and then I will ask you if you, um, I would ask you to put this towel over your head, and I can help you do that if you need me to. Did you want to wear a shower cap for this treatment? Okay. Um, so during the treatment, the, the way that it works is once I pour the water in and we get the towel over your head, um, the steam will be intense at first, as will the peppermint oil. So if you want it to be most intense, the towel should fully cover you. But you don't have to start that way. We can start with it open so that some of the vapors escape, and then we can kind of bring that in as the minutes go by because it will lessen in intensity, but it will still keep the vapors in there. So I'm just going to tell you that up front so that you know what to expect. And we will go for, we'll go for three minutes and see how you do. 
And then at the conclusion of that, I have a towel over here. It had ice water in it earlier, so it's going to be cold, but that's purposeful. So at the conclusion of it, I'll just wring it out and hand it to you and just ask you to, if you're comfortable, wiping your face down. We just want to cool your face down. Okay. Let me put this so you can hear it. Do the steam open up your pores? Steam does open up your pores, and the cold at the end will close your pores. Yeah, very good question. Other questions about this before we begin it? Yes? That's a very good question. The question was, does, do the essential oils have to be food grade? Um, I don't actually know the answer to that question. The essential oils that I buy are food grade because I do use them in those applications. So. Um, that's a good question. I will have to look into that. Any other questions? All right, then let's begin. No. She just asked if I had a tissue. So sometimes, and it's not sometimes, it's, it's not out of the ordinary for this treatment to cause your nose to run, especially if you're congested. That's the whole point of it. So it's good to have some tissues nearby. Um, so that you can blow your nose if you need to, or just wipe your face more generally. All right, so the water is already nice and hot. Thank you for remembering that. So I'm just going to pour it away from you. Don't want to burn you. Nice and hot. Soon you all will be smelling the peppermint oil, I'm sure. It doesn't matter how much. This is about the, the size of bowl I would normally use. Um, and I tend to empty most, if not the entire kettle out. But it depends on you know, what you have available. All right. So I'm going to try not to be in the way. Let me come from this angle. So I'm just going to ask you if you wouldn't mind leaning forward. I have a towel, and I'm going to put it behind you. And then all I need you to do is you put your arms, your elbows up on the table like this. And then the towel I'll drape over you, and you can hold the towel kind of draped in your hand. And then we can determine how much you want it to be closed or not. OK, you got it? OK, so you see how it's open in the front. This is letting some of the vapors out. Is it OK for you right now? Yes. How are you feeling? Okay, so if you wanted it to be a little more intense, all you would have to do is close up this gap, either a little bit or fully, and just be mindful of your face not going too close to the water. You still doing okay? Yes. All right, so I'm gonna set a timer. Yep, breathe in deeply, in and out through both your nose. You can alternate between your nose and your mouth depending on the effect. So sometimes if my throat is bothering me, um, and it's sore, I'll just exclusively breathe through my mouth. Um, sometimes if it's my nose that it's really congested, I will purposefully breathe only through my nose. You still doing okay? All right, so this treatment, again, we're gonna go for about three minutes, um, but you can go up to 20 minutes, and if you were to do it for that long, you could have um, use less of the water in your pot or have like two water pots going or depending on where you're doing this you might do this in a kitchen setting where you have access to a stove if you were doing that I would recommend having additional water available so that if the water um, if the vapor started to die down you could replenish and just add more water you know you'd have to ask your client to back up so that you could add more water but to keep that steam um, going in the towel for, for longer, for up to 20 minutes. Rosalind, you're still doing okay? All right, are you getting too hot? Okay. So you wanna make sure when you're doing this that you're asked, checking in periodically. Like, I'm obviously rushing this right now and, and asking every you know 15 or 30 seconds or something, but if you were doing this for you know five minutes, if you were doing it for 10 minutes, you just wanna make sure that you were nearby, you would not wanna leave the room. You never know how you're the person that you're doing this for is going to react. You know, maybe they become, have you ever gotten too hot and get a little woozy, that feeling? How would you know that if you stepped away? So you want to be nearby, asking questions. If at any moment there was any indication that Rosalind 
was not doing well, I would stop the treatment immediately, take the cold rag, apply it to her face, you know, get her away from the heat source, and then just monitor her, make sure everything's going okay, ask her questions. Obviously, if need be, you could, worst case scenario, call the police, call for the emergency response to come if something went unexpected like that. But for treatment like this, that is not likely to happen, but you know, use common sense as you're doing these treatments as well. Okay, Rosalind, we've got about 50 seconds left. And at the end, I will remove the towel and then hand you the washcloth to apply to your face. While they're waiting, I just have to, while the treatment's going on, I have to say that I used this when I had sinus congestion. I had been on antibiotics in, uh, previously, and it had done nothing. I was desperate enough to use the steam inhalation. This was before I knew anything about hydrotherapy. And I was desperate enough and said, well, let me try this. I, I can't even remember now what prompted me to do it. And with the treatment of peppermint oil, eucalyptus, and I think I had oregano in there also, literally within hours, whereas I had been congested for three weeks, I had opened up. When I first okay, started to do it, I was able to keep my eyes open and breathe it in. But by the time it was, and that was because I was so plugged. By the time it was all said and done, I had to shut my eyes because I had opened up so much. That's when I realized how strong <laughs> everything was. So I can, I'm a testimony that that works. It does. It does. So you couldn't see it. I'll get your question in one second. The steam coming out of the towel when it was done, and her face was very wet with perspiration. Um, you were talking earlier about how some treatments are designed to make you sweat. This one will make you sweat the longer you're under there. Are you feeling okay? Excellent, excellent. Thank you for demonstrating this with us. Yes. Okay, I saw a hand for some questions. Yes, I certainly like to use certain oils for certain things. And up here, and you're welcome to look at this, um, my essential oil collection has grown um, over time. And so I found this on Amazon, and it's by no means full. Um, it's just, just the beginnings of the bottles that I use more frequently. Um, I like to use certain combinations of oils if I have like viral symptoms. So when we had COVID, I had you know, my arsenal of the COVID fighters, the antivirals, oregano is a powerhouse. Frankincense is a powerhouse. Those are the ones that I go to very, very frequently um, if I have cold and flu-like symptoms. Um, if I have, I, I use them, you know, beyond upper respiratory issues. When I get a mosquito bite, a couple drips of tea tree oil on a Q-tip on your skin, the itch goes away. Like I use essential oils as, as often as I can. Um, and depending on what you're trying to, to use them for, um, I, I could recommend a couple different oils for you to try. But if you just go online to a reputable site, not just somebody who has an opinion, but um, somebody that can actually give you real insight into the types of oils to use, I would recommend that. And you don't have to spend a lot of money for them. Like I don't, some of them are quite expensive. Oh, I do have it in here. Um, I like to buy from a company called Mountain Rose Herbs. This is their catalog. You're welcome to look through it. Um, they have a variety of oils. Let me see if I can quickly go to a page that tells me what they are. They sell more than just essential oils. Uh, of course, I can't find it quickly. Um, but I want to say somewhere in the ballpark of 6 to $15 on average for a bottle that is about this size. This is a bad example. This is one of the more expensive ones. Um, this is 5 milliliters. 
Um, so that's what you'd be paying for about this size. If you get into the bigger size jars, something like this size, it'll cost you, you know, depending on what the oil is, maybe $20, $30. Um, for that. If you're only using a few drops, a little bit goes a very long way. So it will last for a while. I also, I'm going to say this now because I'm likely to forget, um, for the contrast showers or just showers in general, dropping a, a drop or two of essential oil in your shower, also in that steam, it releases it, you breathe it in, and it has a similar effect to just, you know, in a, in a smaller way, but a similar effect to what we just demonstrated here. Other questions? All right. We are going to move on then to the contrast shower. Anybody want to volunteer to take a shower right now in front of everybody? <laughs> we are not going to do that. Oh boy. But what we will do is talk through the steps. So obviously I can't fully replicate that experience, um, but I thought it would be helpful nonetheless because the contrast shower next to the steam inhalation is the treatment that I use second most. Um, it is <laughs> it is easy to do. All you need is a shower. Um, it is, I will confess, it is not, it's easy to physically do. It is hard to mentally prepare for that cold in the shower. You know, if you are used to taking nice, beautiful, hot, long showers, and then you turn that cold water on, your body is going to notice the difference really, really quickly. Um, so my suggestion there and advice is the way that I started doing it, it wasn't just crank it all the way to the cold. It was work your way into it, transition into it. So do cool water or as, as cool as you can stand it the first several times. And then challenge yourself a little bit more to take it a little colder and a little colder and a little colder. And eventually you will get to being able to tolerate the coldest setting. All right. So let's shift gears. I'm going to leave that right there because I'm kind of klutzy and I will spill that if I move it somewhere else. Let me get my note card. No, it's good. Okay. So as we did before, we're going to talk about the contrast shower. Um, the contrast shower, well, I don't want to get ahead of myself. I was going to say something, but I know it's in the slides later, so I won't mention that. Okay, first, some general precautions for the contrast shower treatment. Contrast just means hot versus cold. That's really all it means. I like to call it hot, cold shower, but the technical term, at least the way we learned it when we were taking the hydrotherapy um, training last fall was contrast shower. So you never want to use um, contrast shower treatment directly over implanted devices like chemo ports, pacemakers, etc. You want to avoid showering people um, over open wounds or sores. So be mindful of whether your client, you know, if they just, if they have some type of open sore or wound, you want to um, be mindful of that. Maybe it wouldn't, maybe that treatment wouldn't work for them at that point in time or until they're able to heal. You never shower a chilled client with a cool or cold shower. If your client is already cold, you don't want to make them colder. That is not, that is not ideal. Um, you want to carefully monitor the temperature of the water and treat it within the client's tolerance. So again, back to those open-ended questions. You know, you don't just want to crank the cold all the way down and say, grin and bear it, you know, it's almost over, but check, check in with them and say, is this temperature okay? Because, you know, if you are accustomed to doing this treatment on yourself, you know, and you can tolerate that cold, that doesn't mean that everyone can. And so the same way that we had to all take baby steps towards that cold, cold setting, um, the, tr the clients that you treat um, will need the same. I remember when we were working on getting certified in hydrotherapy, um, we had to, so this was, again, I mentioned this a second ago, last fall we went through a six-week course, my mom and I, um, and we had to have our, we had to have patients or clients who we brought with us to practice the treatments on, and one of the people in my group, uh, I don't think mentioned to their client 
like what was about to happen and the cold water went on and the, the person yelled out. It was startling. Um, I think she was startled, we were startled. It was just, you know, but that set in my mind like, okay, I will remember that. Lessons learned. That was helpful for me to see. Uh, other precautions, individuals with decreased sen skin sensation require less extreme temperatures. Um, and then most importantly, perhaps, is use a bath mat. Don't make assumptions about the floor. Like just have a, if you don't have a bath mat, have a towel so that when the person is coming out of the shower, you don't have any slip and falls unexpectedly because then you'd have other things that you have to, to deal with. So contrast shower, definition, it is a series of hot or very hot showers, typically in the 102 to 110 degrees Fahrenheit range, alternated by cold showers, which are 55 to 70 degrees. And 70 degrees might sound like it's warm because who doesn't like a 70 degree day? But in a shower, it is cold, it is cold. And the hot segment always lasts longer than the cold. Common uses, um, athletes use this treatment to prevent delayed onset muscle soreness after exercising. I have used this after exercising vigorously and it does help if you've ever, you know, it doesn't even have to be exercise like in a gym setting exercise, but gardening or, you know, digging dirt or, you know, any type of activity where you're going to get muscle soreness, this treatment works really well for reducing some of that soreness. It can help speed the recovery time of exerting extreme energy in competitions, sports. It can help prevent headaches and migraines or the reduction of full-blown symptoms or shorten the duration. My husband uses this, um, the steam inhalation as well, quite regularly. He suffers from migraines and while it doesn't, for his, he gets pretty intense migraines. It doesn't eliminate his migraines completely, but sometimes it's the difference between a really bad migraine and just, or a, a migraine and a really bad headache. And sometimes a headache is just more tolerable for him. So he'll, if he catches it in time, the contrast shower can really help him in that regard. Um, what are the effects that this has? It helps stimulate, it helps by stimulating the hot and cold receptors in the body. And it vastly increased circulation through the body. Uh, this in part, I think it's, well not in part, I think the reason behind this is because the hot uh, causes, I always get this mixed up, it increases or decreases, it increases the oxygen ability in the cells, right? And then the cold constricts it. And so it increases the circulation in the body by working together for that effect. It stimulates the body as it tries to throw off heat during the hot phase and then conserving heat during the cold phase. It also is known to help increase immunity. This, again, when we had COVID earlier this year, the contrast shower is something that I was doing twice, two times, sometimes three times a day, um, and my son and husband were doing it as well. And it, we, our symptoms, I believe, were shortened um, in part because of you know, treatments like this that we were doing. And then one other effect is that the mechanical receptors on the skin, so uh, earlier my mom talked about skin and the importance of hydrotherapy and how it interacts with the skin. The mechanical receptors on the skin are stimulated by pressure from the shower. So, you know, sometimes if you are doing this treatment, you can use the shower head. So not everybody has a shower head that they can um, change the intensity of the pressure of the water. But if you do, you might experiment with you know, not just the hot or cold, but you know, changing the setting on it so that maybe it's, it's coming out a little bit more intensely at the very end or at the beginning. And just experiment with that and see how it works for you. So under what conditions would you want to consider using this treatment? Um, if, because it stimulates blood flow to the skin, you would want to consider using this to help relieve relieve congestion of your internal organs. Um, if you are tired or lethargic, this might be a, another, good re, another good treatment for you to try out. 
It serves as a tonic or a way to tone your skin. It, I mentioned this previously, can help prevent soreness after vigorous exercise. It can help prevent um, the development of a migraine or headache if you do it quickly enough, that's key. It can help shorten the duration of respiratory cold or flu symptoms. And it can help you develop better tolerance to cold winter weather. Uh, one of the things, now my, my sister-in-law doesn't necessarily do the hot cold showers, but she is from Texas and now lives in Michigan. And I think she's lived here now six years, maybe approaching seven years. And every winter I check in with her and say, are you getting used to Michigan's winters yet? And the first couple years were brutal, absolutely brutal on her um, because, you know, coming from Texas, she didn't have the right jackets to wear, the right gloves to wear, you know, very, very different. But now when I see her in the winter, you know, she's dressed more like a Michigander. So I think her tolerance is, um, has changed over the, over the years. And I think the same is true um, with this treatment as well, both in your ability to withstand it um, while you're doing it, but also to help you develop a tolerance for cold winter weather. And it can, it has been known to help with uh, diabetes. Cautions or things that you need to keep in mind and, and reasons you might not want to do this treatment. So if your client has advanced diabetes, you would want to do a 20 degree difference in temperature. So what that means, let me back up a couple slides. So when we were talking about the definition, so the very hot, the, the temperature range ideally will be between 102 and 110 degrees. So for someone that is in advanced diabetes, we want to drop that temperature um, 20 degrees. We don't want to be in the 100 to 110 range. So that's what that means when it's a 20 degree difference. The same is true um, if your client has a known loss of sensation, if they have neuropathy or you know difficulty with sensation in their hands or in their feet or somewhere else in their body, when you're talking to them, so obviously we talked about this earlier, if you are doing this on your spouse or with your children, chances are you kind of know what health issues that person is struggling with or dealing with. But if you're, you're helping someone that you don't know or a complete stranger, you're not going to know those things. So when you are beginning the treatment and you're asking those types of questions, this is when you would say, okay, you know, do you, do you have any loss of sensation? And it gives them an opportunity to say, yes, I have neuropathy or, you know, I fell and I have a damaged nerve and my left hand bothers me. And then you would know, you know, you'd, you'd know that you need to, to make that uh, degree difference for them. Similarly with pregnancy, uh, if your client is pregnant, you would want a 20 degree difference in temperature as well. For clients that have hyper thyroid or overactive thyroid, you would want to be careful and not do this treatment too frequently as it could stimulate an already overactive thyroid. And another caution would be someone who has an inability to tolerate heat or cold, you would want to use less extreme temperature. Contraindication, so when would you not want to use this? Lymphedema due to disease or surgery, Someone with advanced cardiovascular disease, um, it would cause too much burden on the heart and artery walls, and we wouldn't want to cause that. Someone who's in advanced renal or kidney disease, someone with multiple sclerosis, if they have seizure, seizure disorders, um, extreme obesity, someone who has eaten a meal within an hour, you wanna wait at least an hour after eating for this treatment. Someone who is already chilled, I mentioned this previously, we don't want to um, put cold on someone who's already chilled. Um, and we will talk about this next week, what to do if someone is chilled. We're going to demonstrate the hot foot bath treatment and the Russian steam bath, if I'm not mistaken. And the, the hot foot bath is a really good way to help someone who is chilled to warm up. And then once they're warm, maybe then you could do the contrast shower. So sometimes you have to do treatments in steps. You know, start with one, 
and then move on to the other one, depending on the situation. And then we wouldn't want to do this treatment with someone who has ingested alcohol or illegal drugs. Do you have a question? That's a good question. So it, so it can help with headaches, yes. Um, it depends on how long you do it, how intense, how hot the water is, how cold the water is, but the hot foot bath is one treatment for headaches. Very good question. Yes? Yeah, so this hot cold shower could help with muscle soreness. Um, you know, if you are exercising or just generally have pain like that, this could be a treatment that, would, that could potentially help with, with symptoms like that. Very good questions. Yes? I was asked to repeat the question. Someone said, do you know how hot a regular hot shower is, what the temperature is? I don't know the answer to that, but I can say this. We have uh, a waterless tank at home, and my husband has the temperature set to 130 degrees. It is way too hot. Now, it's great when I'm washing dishes. Like, I never have the hot just full-on hot with the ability to put my hand under the water because it, it burns, and I like, ow, I have to turn the cold on. So I know it's less than 130 degrees. Um, I just don't know. I don't know the exact temperature. Does anyone happen to know? Well, Dan says our water is at 120, and I was able to just get under that for a hot cold shower and have no problem. Okay, with the hot fully cranked on. Okay, so maybe somewhere. Yeah. Um, so one of the things what my mom was just saying is when, so when I kind of show the steps for this treatment, one of the things that you'll be doing is monitoring the temperature of the water. And so when you're doing this, you will have a, a thermometer. Um, I don't know, I personally, when I'm doing this day to day, I don't anymore use the thermometer. I kind of use the, the rule of thumb. I take it as hot as I can stand it and then as cold as I can stand it and alternate between those two. So leaving it, you know, how does it feel to you? And then similarly with your clients. But to be technical and exact, we do use a, a cup with a thermometer and measure the water temperature to make sure it's within the right range when we're doing it. Great questions. Any other questions? Okay. I think we were done with this slide. Equipment. Not a whole lot of equipment is necessary for this. Obviously, you need a shower stall. You need hot and cold water coming out of the faucet. You will need a thermometer, a container to measure the temperature of the water, a bath towel to dry off after the shower, a bath mat for the floor to prevent any slips and falls, grab bars if um, individuals are unsteady. I learned that you can buy um, probably through Amazon and possibly even at like local pharmacies for grab bars. They're the, the kind that have the suction cups that you can just put onto the wall. Have you seen these? Um, which store? Hardware stores. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, so you can, I have not yet invested in purchasing any, but you can get the, the kind that you put in your tote and take with you if you end up being mobile and, and going about helping people doing this or if you just need it at home. That's an option. A body brush or a loofah sponge for extra me mechanical stimulation. So we'll get into this more next week, but with the hydrotherapy treatments, often the cold part of the treatment um, can be intensified not just in the way it feels, but in, in how your body reacts to it if you apply stimulation, manual stimulation, so friction rubs, for example. So when you're done, like instead of just holding the cloth to your face, you could have like vigorously rubbed your face up and down and that would have had an additional healing effect um, that just holding it on your face doesn't necessarily do. Similarly with the contrast shower. So just ending, and we'll talk about this um, I think after the next, oh, it's on the next slide, but just ending on the cold is one thing, but if you want to really invigorate, you know, a cold friction rub uh, can go along with that. And so we'll demonstrate those next week with the treatments that are 
um, designed specifically to work with those. You'll need a time device. I'm sure you won't forget this one, especially if you're doing it yourself in the shower. That cold, you know, the first three seconds, I'm like, it has to have been enough time. We've got to be at the end. And then prayer, um, you know, to pray that God will allow the treatment to work the way that it's intended. So here is the procedure. Uh, the way that we learn this is to think of it as 333. I love thinking of it that way. Three minutes with hot, as hot as you can stand it, or in the range specified earlier, 102 to 110. 30 seconds, as cold as you can stand it, and you repeat that three times. So three, three minutes hot, 30 seconds cold, three minutes hot, 30 seconds cold, three minutes hot, 30 seconds cold. You always end your treatment on cold. Um, so we'll quickly go through these steps, and then I don't know that I have much to demonstrate with this, um, but we can talk through it, and I will show you what I have pertaining to this. So first thing you'll want to do is place a bath mat on the floor in front of the shower. Again, safety first. We don't, when the person, when you get out the shower, when the person steps out of the shower, unless there's carpet in the bathroom, the floor is probably going to be slippery. So you want to make sure that you're, you're ready for um, getting out of the shower. Next thing is that you're going to turn on the shower um, first using a container. Where did I put it? Using a container to catch the water. So I just have a paper cup here. Solo cup works good. Whatever type of, it doesn't have to be a cup, but you need something to catch the water. And then you'll need a thermometer. I got this on Amazon. Um, it's just a probe thermometer. You pull the wand out. You fill the cup up with water the very first time. Put the thermometer in there. Get your first reading. This is before you, you or your client gets in the shower, so you know what the temperature is. You want to get it to that ideal range. Over time, again, it can be based on comfort level, especially as you do this longer and longer. And what you will discover is that your tolerance for both the hot and the cold changes, where you can um, tolerate it hotter than you could maybe a month ago, and you can tolerate it colder than you could some time ago. But start with um, a, a container to catch the water and then a thermometer. After that, once you get it to the ideal temperature, then you or your client will enter the shower and there you will remain for three minutes until you are thoroughly warm. And while you're in the shower, you're rotating. You're not just standing still. You want your whole body to get exposed to this hot water. So you're just kind of slowly rotating, you know, back and forth in the shower, front, back, top to bottom. After the three minutes goes by, then it's time to go to the fun cold. So again, when you're first trying this out, um, it's difficult to find that sweet spot quickly especially, you know, everybody's shower head is different. So one of the things that we learned in, in our training class was maybe for the first several times, have a piece of tape on your shower dial so that you know about where to stop for the hot and put another piece of tape where you need to turn it to get to the cold. So you, you don't have to constantly be using the thermometer to figure it out. That was something that was really, really helpful. So I wanted to make sure that I suggested that here. Um, but after the hot, you go to the cold and 30 seconds. And it's as cold as you can take it. The range, I think, earlier was 55 to 70, if I remember correctly. But the same process. You're going to be rotating in the shower. You're not standing still. Um, rotating, rotating, rotating. You want your whole body, head to toe, to be covered with the cold water. Breathing deeply. Again, if you put essential oils in there, you know, you want to be breathing deeply in or for the, for the purpose of that or just the steam in general. And then once you endure that 30 seconds, um, then it's time to put the hot water back on. And you do that for three minutes. So three minutes hot, 30 seconds cold, repeat it three times. That's the 333. At the conclusion of that, you will turn off the water, step out onto the bath mat, and towel dry briskly. We're on step number nine now. So you just want to towel dry as quickly as you can. Get redressed. You don't want your body to get cold. This is important. You don't want to get chilled after this. You want to be nice and toasty and warm. And then if possible, the ideal thing to do would be to go lay down and rest 
for 30 minutes, undistracted, not lay down rest with your phone in your hand, not be talking on the phone, not you know watching TV, physically rest for 30 minutes and then see how you feel after that. Um, that, in a nutshell, is the contrast shower, yes. You could go to bed, yes, absolutely. Especially if you're doing this and it, it, if it has a relaxing effect for you, absolutely. If you're ready to, to call it in for the night, you could, you could go to sleep from there. Great question. Any other questions? Yes. Well, you could, so the question was, if you just want to stimulate a certain part of the body, is it really necessary to do the rotisserie in the shower? Perhaps not, but the benefit is for the whole body. Like when you are, um, when, the, when the hot is all over your body, it's activating the cells across your body and oxygenating cells and moving blood to and from the areas where it needs it the most. So could you just target your arm and do it that way? Yes, you absolutely could, and that would be perfectly fine. But it's also good for your whole body to get that experience as well. Question? Yes, so she was just mentioning um, fomentations is another hydrotherapy treatment. It's one that we will not be demonstrating in this course, so this is a two-part course. The next course, we've already talked about those being the hot foot bath and the Russian steam bath. Fomentations is a, a very targeted way to do exactly what you're describing. If your shoulder hurts, if your back hurts, if you have congestion in your chest, chest fomentations are essentially a hot pack is what it's called, uh, where you have wool, think of it like an Oreo, an Oreo blanket, the Oreo cookie. You have a, a wool blanket at the top. You have a wet, uh, not soaking wet, wet slash damp, hot steaming towel in the middle, and then another wool blanket beneath it. And that becomes an insulated heat pack that you apply to the area of your body that is inflamed or sore or has congestion in it. And you apply that. I've done it um, on my husband. He had he was having problems with his blood pressure. He, was, he suffers from anxiety, and so I did a round with him for his, uh, on his chest and just applied it on his chest. I think it was about, I want to say it was a good 20 to 30 minute treatment. His blood pressure went back down in the normal range just after the treatment, and he felt better. He was able to relax and unwind and go to bed. So depending on what you're trying to do, chest fomentations would probably be the better choice um, for a targeted approach for you know, shoulder, leg, back, knee, that type of thing. Any other questions? Hot water bottle, so the question is, would you need to use a hot water bottle for that? That could be used. Um, the simplest way, so one of the things that we try to do when, we're, when we've been thinking about doing these seminars is present ways that you can do it with things that you likely already have at home. It's more likely that you have a towel and a blanket um, and could use that instead of having to go and purchase additional equipment. But a hot water bottle could do it. There's also, I forgot the name of them. Do you remember the electric ones that, there's, there's an, like an uh, electrically powered hot pack for lack of a better term. Um, they're, they're not cheap. I think you get them from wherever you would purchase massage supplies, massage therapists. Um, I forget the name of the company. Yes, she was just mentioning that we can, if, if you're interested in that, we can have that information for you at the next session if you wanted to follow up on that. Great questions. Any others before I um, share one other thought? One of the things that I wanted to mention then is, um, so we think about sh um, contrast showers and only being able to do this perhaps with our young children or our spouse, but you can do this with a complete stranger and still be modest. Like they can have their bathing suit on or swimming trunks and you can still perform this treatment. Mo all of the treatments that we've performed or have performed are demonstrating and will demonstrate in the future 
um, you can do this with modesty in mind. So if I'm treating chest foam or excuse me, chest fomentations also, but leg fomentations, you can lay the blankets in a certain way so that the body parts are not exposed. There's no there's nothing exposed during the treatment, and so I want you to be mindful of that. It doesn't have to be, you know, you don't have to think of this, well, I don't want to, you know, do a, a contrast shower on someone that I don't know. Well, you know, if they have, you know, even if they don't have a bathing suit on, if they just had a t-shirt and shorts on, the main goal is to help them by, you know, relieving this congestion, helping their aching muscles in the best way that you can. And they can be fully clothed if that's the case. Like you do want the, the skin exposed ideally, but worst case scenario, if they have to have, you know, pants and a shirt on, so be it. If they're willing to get in the shower, you know, the heat is still going to get in there and get on, on their skin. Okay. Um, so after the treatment, I think I mentioned this, have the either you lie down or have the client lie down, depending on who's doing it, for 30 minutes. Um, and then you'd want, if you were doing this for another person right after, you just want to make sure that you took time to clean and disinfect the shower. All right. Are there any other questions regarding these two treatments? Anything that we need to revisit? Yes. <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. Oh, that's great. And I found that the first cold shot was the worst. Yeah. Yep. It does get better. But again, start with baby steps. Start with, you know, instead of it being where your ideal temperature is on the hot, if you're a wimp like I was, just start with your hot temperature and just scale it back slightly. Start there. You know, start with your comfort level. Build up to, you know, all the way back. It doesn't have to be all or nothing right out at the beginning. Well, I want to, as we close, give you a preview of the next class. Um, we talked about those two treatments that we're going to demonstrate. One is the hot foot bath. I want to tell you what this treatment is good for um, so that you can be thinking about this in ways that you might be able to apply it. This is my, so when we were doing the certification course, this was my cheat sheet um, to help me not forget all the things that I'm supposed to be doing. Um, so it can help prevent or shorten cold, flu, or cough. It can help with internal congestion, headaches, sinusitis, chest issues, asthma. Um, it can help with cramps and constipation. It can help with high blood pressure. It can help with warming the body. It can stop a nosebleed. It can relieve fatigue and nervous tension and aid in relaxation. All of this in a hot foot bath. So we'll show you next time how to properly do a hot foot bath. And then the other treatment that we'll be going over is the Russian steam bath. Earlier you saw a picture of it on the screen. Screen. It is a whole body treatment. You're covered from head to toe. It is very intense, um, but the effects are worth it. So it helps with arthritis, gout, fibromyalgia, sickle cell anemia, onset of cold or flu, full-blown cold flu. It helps with detoxing, general relaxation, um, chronic low back pain, sciatica pain, and it can help with a fracture site after a cast is removed. So that is the Russian steam bath. Oh, where did you put it? Other side? So our next seminar is on October 13th. I have that date right, which I believe is Thursday. All right, same time, same location. We will be demonstrating the treatments that I just um, told you about. And this is a book. We had hoped to have it in time tonight. Um, my mom had ordered some, and we were going to have, I think, some type of raffle or giveaway. We have these books, but they didn't get here in time for tonight. Amazon tricked us. Um, but we will have them next time. 
Uh, this is a book that has a lot of good resources, covers the things that we've talked about tonight, and then some table of contents, treatments, general treatments, hot tub bath, neutral bath, salt glow, wet sheet pack, paraffin bath, ice massage, ice packs. Um, it just goes over a lot of different things, and it talks a little bit about the different conditions, so nervous disorders, skin problems, respiratory problems, digestion disorders. So next week, because we were planning on, or ne next week, next time, because we were planning on doing two giveaways tonight and two next week, next time there will be four books given away. Yes. Thank you for reminding me. Did you have any final things you want to say? All right, unless there are other questions, we will end for the night, and I want to do that with a quick prayer. So are there any other questions? Yes. <laughs> so the question was, drinking water. Nowadays, you can find all types of waters at the grocery store, including alkaline water or whatever non-alkaline water is and everything in between. Are there benefits to one versus the other? I don't have the answer for that. I'm actually curious myself. I've started to look into it a little bit more. I have family members who swear by alkaline only. I have you know, friends and other people that I know, they're like, what's the big deal? Even the water that's in there is probably tap water anyway that's just got some of the impurities taken out. I don't have the answer to that. I don't know if anyone else does know. Okay. Ah. Uh. I have never done it. I think I heard it called a neti pot, um, where there's some type of, for allergy sufferers, I think it's marketed for in particular, where you, you somehow put water up your nose and it's supposed to help. I haven't done that. Um, has anyone in the room experienced that? You have? <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. I can say the time that I had the sinusitis and I had tried the antibiotics and I tried that neti pot, I thought I was going to drown myself with the neti pot, literally. Um, none of that worked for me. It was the inhalation treatment that finally worked for me. That's a good question. The question is, are there any expiration dates on essential oils? If there are, I'm not aware of it. I wonder if they just kind of over time lose their potency. I don't know what what the average shelf life is. Obviously, the manufacturers are going to tell you, oh, you have to, you know, use this within six months or whatever. I don't know. Um, I've had mine for some time, and they have not failed me yet. Yeah. I see two questions in the back. Yes. Yes. Yeah. All right, well, we are ending early, so I'm going to close out with a quick prayer. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Father in heaven, we thank you so much for giving us wisdom to know how to take care of our bodies better. 
Lord, we just pray that the things that we've learned here tonight, that we will take them home and start using them. Please bring them back to our minds when we're suffering and sick so that we can use water, which you've given to us in abundance, to help treat and allay some of the uh, issues that we struggle and deal with. And we pray that as we... Um, take those steps that you will multiply and bless those efforts, Lord, and help us as we're learning to do them correctly and for them to have the intended effect is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everyone. We hope to see you October 13th.